uh, welcome to the interesting session, the symposium regarding what I'm doing differently this year in my practice. We have a distinguished speakers that we are talking, they are talking about the new techniques in their practice. The first speaker will be Dr. Richard Abbott. He will talk about how to adopt or incorporate new technology in your practice. Please, Dr. Richard. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be part of this symposium because it's a very important topic as we have so much new technology and we're going to hear uh, what we're all doing. But one of the key issues for many of us is how do we incorporate new technology into our, into our inter-segment practice? <clears throat> so if we look at new technology, and we can make this list uh, twice as long, but fake IOLs, accommodating IOLs, uh, cross-linking, artificial corneas, femtosecond laser surgery, torex, corneal inlays, and we can go on and on. So there's a lot of choices for us. Um, <clears throat> let's go back in time. I trained uh, back uh, in the 70s, and at that time, this was the new technology that was offered to me uh, when I was in my training and my fellowship in Miami and Boston. And uh, I guess one of the reasons I went into cornea is because we ended up taking out more of these lenses than uh, we ever put in. So <clears throat> what you need to think about is and understand, especially in anterior segment, it, what about uh, effects on the cornea, uh, secondary glaucoma? Uh, are there any effects to the retina, uh, uveitis issues, hyphema, the so-called UGG syndrome that we saw that was very prevalent back then? So the key questions for us are uh, really what is the decision on whether or not to adopt a new technology? Uh, and we'll go through each of these and then how to best incorporate that new technology. So the first question and whether to do it is, does it improve the quality of care for our patients? Or do we have improved outcomes with the new technology? Are there less complications? And is there less risk? Does it improve the efficiency in delivering care to our patients? Does it save time as we adopt after we get through the learning curve? Are there less medical errors? What about our staff? Are there more requirements? Does it cost more money to adopt this new technology? Does it make financial sense? Do we understand the impact on our work and patient flow? Certainly with femtosecond cataract surgery, this has had an impact, and you have to figure out how to make this work and understand the finances. Also, the patient flow in your operating room or in your office, and do you have the space for this new technology? So, <clears throat> after trying to answer all those questions, and we'll hear about new technology today in this symposium, we then need to say, okay, I'm going to try this new technology. What is the best approach to incorporating it into our practice? There are several ethical issues, certainly informed consent, making sure the patient understands the advantages and disadvantages to what we're doing. There's a learning curve for all of us in adapting this new technology, and there are several steps to learning a new technique. Also, we have to understand careful patient selection and not be too aggressive, especially in our early part of our learning curve. And we need to disclose to our patients our experience. If this is a new procedure, we can say we're an experienced anterior segment surgeon, but this is my first or second or fifth case, and, uh, but you know we have mentors and I feel comfortable, and there are various ways to say this to patients. But they should know that it's early on in your experience. So patients really need to understand what they're choosing. So how much training is enough? And what should the patient know? And that, that's referred to as the learning curve. And this is something we go through as we start our training as residents, but we continue throughout our career. And I think about uh, when I was a resident, I actually learned intracap and then went to extracap and then to FACO. And same in corneal transplant, moving from 
penetrating to DSEC and DMEC and so forth. So a learning curve is part of acquiring new skills and the basic tenant is we need to minimize the risk to our patients. So the steps in the learning a new technique is one, a commitment of time. We start by going to meetings like this, reading, reviewing CDs, attending courses, looking at uh, uh, videos online, lectures, observing experienced colleagues who are doing the technique. And then I think very important, working with a mentor, somebody who can sit with you at your side and help you through your early cases. And then practicing also on cadaver eyes. So the key is to proceed in a very careful, graded approach and you will then gain the confidence and the experience you need to move on to more uh, complicated cases and work by yourself. It's important, for instance, in FACO that you don't choose a patient with a, a very small pupil or a very hard nucleus or exfoliation syndrome or any of the risk factors that would lead to complications when you're first learning a procedure. Uh, having a mentor at your side is important. Sometimes in communities, your competition who may be doing the case may not want to assist you so that you can learn. You may have to bring in a mentor from outside the community to help you. And then it's key that you have careful, thorough post-operative evaluation because you learn by examining that patient post-operatively what you maybe could have done better <clears throat> and how you can improve in the future. So what you should say when you disclose, I think it's important that the patient knows that you are an experienced surgeon and that this is more or less a variation on the technique that you're skilled to do and that you will have somebody sitting with you, uh, hopefully as a mentor that you've practiced, you've gone to courses and that you're confident they'll have a good outcome. But I think it's important that they know that this is uh, an early case for you and have the option to go see somebody more experienced if they choose. And then you need to document everything in the medical record. Your discussion, uh, your patient, why you chose this patient, and your reasons for moving ahead. This is mainly for medical legal reasons, uh, just in case you do have a complication. And uh, it will document the fact that you did have this discussion with the patient. So where do you draw the line between offering the newest technology and what is in the best interest of your patient? Uh, we all have different lines in the sand. Some of us are more aggressive in how we approach things. Some of us are more conservative. It has to do with our personality. It has to do with our experiences as a professional. It doesn't mean that one is right or wrong, but for each of us as we adopt new technology, and we'll hear a lot of that in the, with the following speakers. All of us in the audience have to say, yes, that's something very innovative, it looks good, there's good evidence to support that this is a good technology, I'm going to adopt it, and here's my plan to do it. Or, I'm going to wait, I don't think it is good technology. I don't want to have problem for my patient in case there is a complication or something is not known, and I'm going to wait. So look for evidence of improved outcome and lower risk for the patient with new technology. And the bottom line is, you know, as you make that decision, would you have it done on yourself or uh, a family member? Always, always ask the question, is it good for my patient? Not is it good for my bottom line, but is it good for my patient? That's what we really need to have utmost in our thoughts. Unrealistic expectations by patients are very important to recognize, especially early on as we adopt this technology. And if you have a patient who has unrealistic expectations of what their outcome would be and won't accept the fact that there could be a complication or a less than perfect outcome, you should uh, not do that patient and refer them to somebody else. So the bar has been raised with more advanced technology and improved surgical techniques. There are increased expectations by our patients for improved quality of vision in both day and night <coughs> conditions, as well as at distance and near. And as we get more advanced in presbyopic correction and other technology, those ex expectations and the marketing 
for these procedures will increase. Even if it's not your marketing, it's somebody in your community, the patient comes in expecting uh, only the best. You want to avoid this, getting that angry phone call from a disappointed patient. It's no fun. So it's not worth it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Richard. A very guiding presentation. Uh, the next speaker will be prof, uh, pro, uh, Dr. Rafael Bilbao. He will talk about a new compound technique for epithelial debridement and PRK and cross-linking. Please, Dr. Bilbao. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Yes, we would like just to present you a very simple maneuver that we have been performing during the last years. Uh, that has simplified very much our surgical procedures. We would like to share it with you. During the last decades, there's been a trend uh, favoring corneal photoplative surface ablation techniques. And several techniques for epithelium debridement have been described. You can do it with mechanical, scalpel, blades, rotating brushes. You can perform LASIK with alcohol solutions. You can perform a transepithelial PRK, or you can perform an epilasic. We present you a technique to peel off corneal epithelium before the photoablation when we perform surface ablation surgery that combines both a chemical and a blunt mechanical action. We present here our first results for our myopic patients. The video was supposed, we, we tried it yesterday, it was supposed to enter automatically. No. There's a video who was charged yesterday and it was supposed to enter automatically. Can we fix the video, please? Can you settle to a broader image and increase for photoablation in laser surface refractive surgery. An eight or nine millimeter circular weak cell sponge soaked in 20% alcohol solution is positioned over the central corneal surface for 50 seconds. If some solution leaks towards the periphery, it is dried with another weak cell spare. This avoids the damage of the limbal stem cells and the irritation of the patient conjunctiva produced by the alcohol solution. Once the circular sponge is discarded, we wash the alcohol solution remnant with two flushes of cold saline solution. We then release epithelial adhesions by applying some pressure with circular movements over the central surface of the cornea. Finally, central loosened corneal epithelium is easily lifted off with the same weak cell spear in a circular epithelioresis manner. If the surgeon prefers to replace the epithelium over the stromal surface after laser ablation, he could do it as the whole epithelium can be lifted and spoiled. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, thank you very much. This study was a retrospective consecutive interventional case series uh, in which myopic PRK patients were operated by one single surgeon between April 2011 and March 2013. PRK using the described corneal epithelium debridement technique was used and photoablation was later performed with the Technolast platform with our, uh, with our normal nomograms and algorithms. We applied mitomycin C to all of our eyes operated uh, between 12 and 20 seconds of the exposition, depending on the depth of the central ablation. A silicone hydrogel contact lens was used thereafter. 24 myopic eyes were operated with no previous eye problems or surgeries performed. The mean age was 32 years of, years of age, and the mean preparative spherical equivalent was minus 373. Uh, the mean preoperative astigmatism was minus uh, 0.65, 
and the best corrected preoperative visual acuity was very good, 0.98. The mean follow-up was six months. Yes, six months was the minimum follow-up. As you can see, the refractive results were very good. The spherical equivalent went from minus 373 to almost emetropia. The astigmatism was well corrected, and the corrected visual acuity went from 0.98 to 1. The scatter uh, the, of the achieved spherical equivalent versus the attempted is this, and 96% uh, of our eyes had a uh, manifest refractive spherical equivalent between plus and minus 0.5, whereas 99.5 had, had it uh, between plus 1 and minus 1 diopter. Regarding the safety results, no eyes lost two or more lines of visual acuity, and the safety index was 1.02. Regarding the efficacy results, the efficacy index was 0.98. Uh, the mean time for rehabilitation and contact lens removal was five days. No eye required more than 14 days of contact lens wear. No eye had a significant complications. Eight eye had a transient haze degree, uh, one, and only one of the 248 eyes required an enhancement procedure. Several techniques have been uh, described for epithelial debridement. Uh, several studies have compared them regarding uh, the visual and refractive outcomes, the pain, the speed in epithelial healing, the haze formation, but the results are contra contradictory. Some of them say one thing, some others conclude another, other things. What we must say is that each previous techniques that we have tried previously has its advantages and its pitfalls. Uh, mechanical debridement is a straightforward and effective, but Bowman layer can be damaged during this maneuver and a more regular anterior stromal surface and retained islands of residual epithelium have been described and the patient discomfort is usually greater. When we perform uh, eczema laser transepithelial uh, uh, debridement, uh, the technique is easy and fast but sometimes it is difficult to assess that all the epithelium has been removed and this may lead to a hypo or hyper corrections. Alcohol-assisted debridement technique is easier, fast, and very comfortable for the patient, but some pressure needs to be applied over the globe, and for some anxious patient, this can be also more difficult. And alcohol may spill around the surface of the eye, and this can produce irritation and damage of the stimulant cells. Lasik needs sophisticated surgical material, and Bowman or anterior uh, stroma or even the optic nerve can be damaged during the, this procedure. The described epithelium debriding technique combines the advantages of a chemical and a mechanical non-traumatic effect. No pressure of the globe or alcohol spilling can be produced and no use of sharp coating or sophisticated instruments are needed. This, all these circumstances minimize the patient discomfort. But we need to expose the epithelium surface to 50 seconds of contact. This allows the lifting of a complete epithelial flap that, as I mentioned during the video, can be repositioned if the patient thinks, still thinks that this layer of epithelium is helpful for something. It has been used for other techniques. We have used it, for, we use it regularly for cross-linking or other techniques in which we need to um, debride the corneal epithelium. And it has been very, very extensively used by our group since our first introduction uh, at the end of 2011. In conclusion, this corneal epithelium debridement technique has allowed us to optimize our results when correcting myopia with surface ablation photorefractive sur surgery, possibly minimi minimizing intraoperative corneal damage, thus reducing postoperative inflammation and, we think, improving our surgical performance. This technique, if anybody is interested, if anybody has or is interested, has just been recently published in Journal of Emetropia. It's a very nice magazine. It is free. You can access through internet. It's the Journal of the Spanish Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeon, the SECOIR. Okay, you can have access and you have a very detailed exposition of the technique in the last issue. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Rafael. Uh, may I have a question for you, Dr. Rafael, please? What about the post-operative pain score? Is any difference from the other technique regarding the manual or the alcohol-assisted or the... We haven't done a specific study regarding this issue, but our experience is that uh, it is less than when we used the, only the alcohol with the, with the SOC, the, the classical uh, technique described in the, for, for LASIK. We think we have uh, less pain in our patients because the trauma, the inflammation, uh, the, the trauma is less, thus the inflammation in the patient's eye is also less. We also, as I said, minimize the risk to have some spilling of the alcohol, which is a very irritating substance for the surface of the eye. We have done many, many, many cases of surface ablation procedures, and now our post-operative treatment is very uh, calculated, and I think this has also helped us to, to perform more and more surface ablation in the last years. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Aliu. He will present on corneal keratopigmentation for cosmetic, cosmetic and therapeutic purpose. Please, Dr. Aliu. Good morning. And this topic is a very innovative and interesting one. And I'm going to show to you how we are using this new technique in order to treat specific cases of therapeutic, functional, or cosmetic purposes. So the main issue is, can we change the color of the eye? Can we use the cornea as the place to, to allocate <clears throat> different pigments in order to change the color for different purposes? This is not a new technique because Galino started this many years ago at the beginning of the history of medicine. And indeed, they already, uh, Galino and his colleagues, appreciate the, the relevance for uh, those uh, patients that have a, a cosmetic imbalance due to coronal leucoma, severe coronal leucoma, to relieve this using different pigments applied onto the cornea. Uh, the problem that uh, historically has happened since the very beginning and since Galino times is that the pigments are not stable. The pigments are easy to be con easy to contaminated. The pigments can induce uh, changes in the cornea, can induce inflammation, can be de develop toxic effects, and so the problem has been how to use the pigments, but basically which pigments to use. <coughs> And we have different reasons in order to develop this technique. First of all, we have the potential to improve cosmetically disabled eyes in patients that have corneal leucomas or, or corneal opacities or different problems in the eye, especially in blind eyes, and that can use cosmetic contact lenses, ocular prosthesis. This, uh, indeed, many times there is no role of corneal transplantation due to the cost and the availability of corneal tissue and the restoration and nucleation and mutilating procedures that not always have a good outcome. So the issue is that we have different problems others than, than the cosmetic because we have patients with extensive iris coloboma, peripheral aridectomies that are causing diplopia or glare, partial, total uh, or partial aniridia for uh, especially traumatic. We have also our reactive pupils with photopic, uh, with photic symptoms that have <clears throat> no, no, no way to be treated, intractable diplopia, and the experimentation differs with, uh, with, uh, due to different uh, ocular problems that uh, cause visual disability or cosmetic disability to young patients. And not only that, we have to remember that we have AIs with theories of heterochromia, and we have patients that wish on purpose to change the color of the eye because psychological reasons or because they really feel this, this idea. <clears throat> so our purpose since nine years of investigation is to develop techniques to cornea keratopigmentation to, to change or to improve the cosmetic appearance or the functional disability of the patients and using a, a, a mineralized a pigments specifically developed for the purpose. The potential of this technique has been demonstrated in about nine papers that you can follow in the peer review literature. These papers uh, are dealing with experimental stages of the technique and also with the practical application in a, a quite significant number of cases. And this is a good clinical example of what we can do today with these cosmetic uh, issues. We have this patient in which we had cut a uh, surgery, we increased the volume of the cornea, and finally we had with keratopigmentation this outstanding and remarkable effect. <clears throat> so we have developed what we call the Vision IMP system, developing the pigments, demonstrating the lack of immediate and late toxicity, the long-term stability, and we have already a report of, of, of more than five eight to seven years of follow-up to develop surgical techniques uh, with the specific instruments as well, and to develop a systematic approach for the use of this surgical technique on a repeatable basis. This has been the purpose of our uh, study on the purpose. We have this patent that, uh, that protects our technology and the name that we use, and this is a patent uh, that is at the moment acknowledged in the United States also. 
So this uh, study has been uh, sponsored by the Spanish uh, government and the Ministry of uh, Innovation, and uh, we have started with the pigments. Uh, you have to know that vegetal pigments are unsuitable for keratin pigmentation. They are the ones that are using more in uh, dermatology, but they have easy, they have easy co uh, potential for co to be contaminated, and they have biological hazards. Mineral pigments should be micronized because the size is matters to the cornea, and the mythological the twin pigments are not adequate for the cornea at all. Mineral pigments should have an adequate background of experimental studies because sometimes what is good in short term demonstrates to have a long term effect because the exposure of to light that the cornea has in real life. <clears throat> the potential risk of the pigments are redox reaction, uh, stability, and the potential for uh, late, uh, late changes. And uh, remember, the, uh, they are easily contaminated, and so stability is one of the issues, like in all surgical steps, should be clearly followed. These are the pigments. We have uh, sterile packages in which we can open, we can mix at the moment of the, of, of the use. We can uh, customize any, any color, but we have basic colors to be used specifically in cases in which we have um, 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 an array of colors to develop, but any specific color can be developed on purpose. And we have a pilot investigation with 40 patients in 40 eyes, in which we use this type of micronized pigments with different compositions, and we had this technique as a compassive alternative indication to enucleation of evisceration. So these patients were with no other chance that mutilating should refer uh, to relieve the problem. This was the different causes that led to our cases to decide this procedure, and <clears throat> we de developed two techniques. First is the intralamp Keratin pigmentation, either from the second laser assisted or manual, and the superficial keratin pigmentation techniques. These are the, list, the instruments that we have developed. They are manufactured in the United States by Epsilon, and they are uh, used for the different steps of the manual technique. You have to see uh, these ones are very important in order to achieve the limbus uh, in the corneal tunnel in which we introduce the pigments. And in the case that the cornea has no superficial opacities and is uh, good for the purpose, we use the intralace, and, uh, and this specific uh, device is the one that we have found the best for the purpose using other laces as well. They have not been working so good in order to create tunnel and spaces and to recreate the space for the people and to develop in this way the adequate space for the pigments. It's not working. Okay, let me show to you now how we are going to treat this case that I will show to you later. We try to reproduce the iris because, as you see, we have an <coughs> essential iris atrophy with polychoria and low endothelial cell density, so very difficult to solve by any uh, um, uh, surgical technique. For, uh, once that we create the tunnel, we are going to cut this bridge in order to eliminate the polychoria of the patient and the, and the diplopia. We do it under uh, viscoelastic, viscoid, uh, uh, cohesive viscoelastic. We are cutting out the iris and the iris is retracted and finally is cut. We have a uniform pupil, obviously is dilated, and uh, here we are going to introduce the macronized pigment that has been made for the purpose in the tunnel created by the femtosecond. Look how we are uh, increasing the size towards the periphery and uh, creating the adequate pupil diameter for the purpose. In this case, we select the five millimeters, and uh, uh, still lasers cannot be customized to reach any type of diameter of the cornea, and this is why you need to use these manual instruments or they can be used manually anyhow if you don't have a an, an, um, femtosecond laser. This is the pigment. It's the way in which we are uh, ending in the case, and this is one of the methods that we use for this type of technology. The patient is expected to have normal vision because this patient was emetropic and had no other problem. This is other technique in which we are using the, the, the deep technique. Uh, the, uh, this was a uh, rest of syndrome following fake intraocular surgery implantation. Look here how we are creating two tunnels. One is for the black color because the patient had blue eyes, and the black color is to, to have a, a, a barrier to the light, and then the superficial tunnel in order to, to match the patient with a pigment that matches the other eye. So we are now opening through two different incisions. One is the superficial tunnel for the color. The the other is a deep tunnel in order to, uh, to introduce the black color and to make the patient uh, not uh, permeable to light and to avoid the that, uh, very disabling photophobia the patient had. We are increasing 
the size of the, corn, the, of the tunnel towards the periphery. It's very important to reach the periphery because otherwise the light that is entering towards the periphery really is able to, to, to recreate part of the clear of the patient. And in doing that, we use the two different incisions. One, remember, is for the superficial and the other is for the deep. This is the black color that we are using. As you see, we are recreating what is the pigmentary epithelium of the iris. Exactly this is the idea. And now in the superficial, we are going to introduce the, the blue-green color, which is the color that the patient had uh, in the, in, on, on, the, um, on the other eye. And with this pigment was created on the purpose to match the, 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 the color and to create a functional and cosmetic uh, um, adequate uh, outcome. Here we are <coughs> increasing the, and, and matching the adequate diameter of the, of the eye and now let's see how we are using the, the, the blue-green pigment in order to make the eye to be with a color that is about what is going to be the, in the other eye. This is the, the pigment implantation. The density depends on the, on the dilution and the dilution is made depending on what we want to get. Then the distribution of the pigment uh, in the different lois is achieved. We have to be careful in order to be uh, matching the color, uh, looking at the other eye. Many, many times we have a different and, and a second step, like you would see here, in order to recreate the, the color. Look here how we are giving a normal aspect to the iris because this color is very flat, and having flat colors doesn't look normal or not completely normal. Having this uh, type of superficial technique, we can increase the, the, the cosmetic aspect to normal, and we can create the heterozygotical iris that they are very frequent in my area in which you have some uh, black or, or brown pigment, uh, brown uh, areas in order to have the cosmetic appearance that is given to the normal eye. The real appearance finally is really good. What you see here is affected by the aspect of the pigment on the epithelium because the epithelium is not removed and basically the outcome was really very good. So we had this evaluation but independent observing which we had the, the, the observer, observer, uh, opinion and the uh, uh, opinion of the patient. You look here, different cases. This is one case of the series. This is another case in which we had a stabismo surgery and we combine in this difficult color because it's a blue uh, patient, blue eyes patient. This is a patient that, that had a terrorist, uh, was a victim of a terrorist attack in um, in one of the neighbor countries, and this is the aspect of the patient after the cosmetic pigmentation. This is a, the pre and the post operative appearance of the patient, had a physical eye. This is a leucomatous eye, but we partially sighted a pre operatively, and this is post operatively once that we did also the, the, the surgery. This is one patient that was for many, many years like this, and he was psychologically affected with his sovismo surgery and keratopigmentation. This was the appearance of the eye, excuse me, and this is even three years after surgery. These pigments are totally stable as we develop. This. this is another patient that had a long-standing corneal leucoma due to the blindness related to a retinal detachment and look the appearance of the patient after one year of follow-up. So with the, uh, according with the medical uh, observer, uh, results were to, uh, from very good to excellent and only one uh, case did uh, only good. So all the cases did very well drinking to very good to excellent and patient opinion was from very good to excellent. So we match the opinion of the patient with the opinion of the doctor and this was an independent uh, observed opinion taking this data. The complications were Minimal, uh, we had no case with uh, any superficial ulcer, and we had one case of severe coronal edema and vascularization related to one of the initial pigments that we used, something that we learned very quickly that we had different cases, uh, different types of pigments to use. This is one of the patients that I have shown to you, different cases, and uh, about functional cases, we had this uh, patient suffering from, because, uh, from normal vision, but with severe functional disabilities because photic uh, phenomena, uh, polychoria, or um, or the uh, intractable glare. This is the case that you, you saw before. Uh, this is um, 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 progressive endothelial iris atrophy. And you see here how in six months went from here to there after one year and after the treatment. The patient was totally stable and, to and the symptoms totally disappeared. This is the aspect of the eye. Pure and post, and you can see here the evolution of the patient in the, uh, from before the surgery to after the surgery. We had this, case, this type of cases in which we have the, the, the documentation about the long term stability. A long term for us is five years or more, and you see that these cases were between functional and therapeutic uh, divided into these two groups. These are the changes that, you, that we, we did. In some cases, we observed a change in color. In other, we had partial disappearance of the color, and in other, the color turned in a in a, in a, in a, a more 
a, a, a darker one. This is related to the redox reaction, and this has been eliminated with the new pigments that finally have obtained the CMR mark in Europe. So the results are really good in the cosmetic therapeutic um, group were excellent. Obviously, we're, we're dealing with patients that have no other hope, and they were happy to, uh, to enter into the study. But about the functional cases, indeed, we had a, 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 a very good cases with 75% of the cases, and then talking about patients with normal vision or almost normal vision of functional disability, we're extremely happy with the outcome. So this is uh, what I want to tell you just uh, about the conclusion. Indeed, we have a, at this moment a technique that is proven to be safe, long-term permanent, and is working for cosme as a cosmetic alternative for disabled eyes, for functionally disabled eyes, and also for purely cosmetic purposes, which is the latest indication we're using. For further information, you can go to this web page that is specifically dealing, this is our web page for this uh, particular technique in which we deal about this issue. In summary, well, this is uh, about what we have. It's our R&D study, and I thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Professor Aliu. Uh, are you manufacturing, Dr. Aliu, this um, dyes in your lab? Or this is available in the market or only in, in your it's hospital? Not yet available, not, not yet available, but will be because we are opening now during this very year the commercial use by another company. What so about the post-operative inflammation? Do you have any post-operative no, inflammation? Are you using any steroid or No, we, we use the same treatment like in PRK, let me tell you. Okay. We have some, uh, that, there are two issues first. Uh, in the femtosecond, you have minimal discomfort. In the superficial technique, you have the discomfort this is which is typical of a superficial uh, erosion. So you have to treat like a PRK uh, with the same medication. And uh, then in the, in the, in, in the medium follow-up, and I'm talking from one to two months, uh, some of the cases have a uh, light sensitivity. This light sensitivity is related to the uh, irritation of the, of the corneal nerves, and for obviously. the superficial technique, you are removing the epithelium and putting the dye. We, we don't remove the epithelium. We, we do the, 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 the use of this technique with the epithelium on. Obviously, you have some epithelial deprivement, but the epithelium is later on substituted, and if you eliminate the epithelium, you have a post that is delayed. So I don't recommend to you el eliminate the epithelium. But Thank there you. are many technical aspects that have to be discussed, because technique is new as very specific. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Francesco Carons from Italy. We will talk about corneal inlay. Please, Dr. Francesco. Thank you, Isham. Good morning, everybody. So what am I doing new this year? I'm going to talk about the presbyopia correction using a, a small aperture inlay. And I want to just start uh, uh, pointing out one of the biggest differences across this technique. Uh, for correcting presbyopia, we have either mono or binocular procedures. Uh, the inlay uh, positioning uh, falls uh, under the uh, additive uh, monocular procedures. So you, will, you may want to treat just one eye with this technique. What is on the uh, back of this idea? Here you see a schematic drawing of the inlay. This is a small uh, uh, device uh, made uh, with a PD PVDF, uh, which provides the, uh, the patient uh, with an increase uh, in depth uh, of focus, as you can see pictured here. And you see here one inlay positioned. Uh, the target of this surgery is having the non-dominant eye implanted with the inlay and uh, the dominant eye targeted distance. So the overlap of the vision between the two eyes uh, is uh, pretty good for distance, uh, and the eye with the inlay uh, provides uh, about a 2 to 2.5 diopters of uh, increased depth of focus, which is very nice, uh, uh, nicely demonstrated by the uh, OCAS uh, 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 instruments, uh, where the eye with the uh, inlay implanted actually has, uh, as you see here, an increased depth of focus uh, while the dominant eye being focused at distance uh, does not. Um, one of the biggest advantages uh, of uh, this technology compared to uh, monovision techniques uh, is that the best case scenario is that you have uh, uh, an eye focused uh, for uh, distance, uh, as you see here, and uh, the not dominant eye focused at distance but providing this increased depth of field. 
If you compared this best case scenario to data from a typical monovision uh, treatment, uh, here you see the difference. Uh, the eye with monovision peaks uh, at a certain focal distance, uh, but provides nothing in between. So the biggest advantage is really to expanding, to increasing this depth of field. And the second advantage is that by increasing the depth of field, uh, you virtually do not use any stereopsis, uh, as it usually happens uh, with uh, 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 monovision uh, procedures. Um, with the uh, inlay, uh, with, the, with this kind of inlay, uh, you can treat uh, what uh, kind of broad spectrum of patients, uh, ametrops, uh, ametrops, like eyes adding a laser procedure, post LASIK patients uh, as well as very, are very good candidates as well as uh, monofocal pseudofix. Uh, um, here are some of the objective patient selection criteria. Obviously, we want to stay in the presbyopic age. Uh, spherical equivalent uh, ranging in between uh, minus 5 to plus 3 is fine. Just remember that uh, in these cases, uh, you need to add a laser ablation or a laser correction, um, as well as if you have any cylinder. You may want to avoid to have a pupil diameters too wide uh, under uh, scotopic uh, uh, measurements. Uh, you may want to target uh, the final refraction of slightly myopic uh, because the pinhole effect of the inlay increases, uh, I mean, is increased by, uh, in terms of efficacy, efficacy uh, um, if you have a slightly myopic outcome, uh, but at the same time, the pinhole effect uh, would, would uh, compensate for the slight myopic uh, uh, outcome as regards distant vision. So typically, these patients uh, can see 20-20 even if they are minus 0.5 or minus 0.75. And obviously, you want to respect uh, all the parameters as regards the thickness uh, and so. You may want to implant the inlay using different techniques. Uh, I have to say that uh, today the most reliable technique uh, involves uh, the performance uh, of uh, a pocket. That was the same in my hand uh, when I shifted from uh, a lamellar flap uh, to a pocket. Uh, my results improved uh, quite significantly, both in terms of uh, patient satisfaction, refractive stability, corner topography changes, uh, and uh, 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 speed of recovery. So by today, you may, don't want, you may not want to do any more any flaps and position the inlay under the flap. Uh, all techniques involve uh, uh, the uh, uh, performance uh, of a, a pocket. So for emetropic eyes, you may just want to do a pocket and in place the inlay, uh, same as for post-LASIK eyes if they are plano, while if you have a refractive error to compensate with simultaneously with laser, you may want to do two interfaces, uh, one relatively shallow for the laser ablation and one much deeper for the pocket. The pocket should usually be 200 microns or more deep into the corneal stroma. So if, if you are approaching the technique, uh, you may want to do both. Uh, okay, here is a very almost going clip showing you once the pocket is made, how easy it is to separate the tissue. And what I'm doing relatively new this year is that finally with the wavelet system I'm using, I'm able to perform pockets. And the pocket, as I said, made the procedure not only more <coughs> effective and reliable, but also much easier in terms of centration because you may, want, you, you may easily mark the cornea uh, before the surgery and just position the inlay according to your corneal marking. And uh, you know, when, when, when positioning the inlay, as you see here, one of the challenges is putting it in the right position because you don't see the pupil, you don't have left reference mark, uh, la um, landmarks, uh, but if you mark the cornea, this procedure is much easier. You may want to position the inlay accurately and then slide out uh, with, the, with the instrument very slowly as to avoid uh, dragging the uh, inlay outside of the of the, of the pocket, and that's, that's it. The surgery, surgery is very easy. Here you see um, the appearance of the inlay once implanted. Uh, cosmetically speaking, can be visible for eyes uh, with a light color, like in this uh, example, but uh, uh, over the series of patients I've implanted, uh, I have no complaints in terms of uh, uh, cosmetic aspects of visibility. Here are some personal results I get. Uh, I, I got uh, uh, visual acuity in terms of safety was uh, quite good. Uh, so we had no eyes, uh, see, no single eye with the camera implanted, seen worse than 2025. 20, uh, <coughs> sorry, and none of the eyes lost more than one snail and 
best corrected visual acuity compared to preoperatively. And you, see, can, you can see here the uncorrected distance visual acuity at four meters for the eye implanted with the camera. What can you see here? You see that roughly half of the patients could still see uh, uh, 2020 at uh, 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 six uh, 12 months after surgery, obviously the performance of the eye with the camera is not as good uh, as a virgin eye, but uh, as regards the binocular vision is much better than monovision. In terms of uh, the accommodative power that this uh, technique offers, uh, here is the accommodation amplitude uh, measured uh, with the minus uh, lens uh, test, so quite a good uh, result. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, near distance vision at 60 centimeters, uh, you see that at that distance, uh, the two eyes working together were quite performing. Obviously, going closer, 40 centimeters, uh, the performance reduces. Uh, but the, the degree of spectacle independence that this technique is able to provide is uh, pretty satisfactory for the patients. The binocular contrast sensitivity showed a slight uh, decrease, but not really significant. And uh, in terms of functional vision, most of the patients are shown to be quite uh, satisfied, quite happy with the results, uh, thus improving those specific areas that they were uh, targeted at. In terms of long-term results, and this is not a, a, these are not data for mine, this uh, uh, um, graph shows you that over a four-year period there is no decrease in the efficacy of the inlay in terms of, of uh, uh, um, quality of vision or distance vision and uh, 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 focusing at near uh, ability. Here are some typical uh, uh, corneal topography, uh, it's a typical topography before one week, uh, one month, and six months of the surgery. You may notice uh, a mild uh, steepening in the periphery, which may maintains uh, stable in most of the cases, unless you have uh, problems like uh, inflammatory reaction or so, which are quite uncommon, especially when uh, doing a pocket. The technique is reversible, the inlay can be removed. Uh, uh, it takes quite a lot of time to the eyes uh, to recover their visual properties if you remove the inlay. In my series, I have about 3% uh, uh, of cases that has been removed because of, of patients' uh, insatisfaction as regards the quality of vision. But uh, it may take like six months to recover to them, uh, but all, pay, all eyes uh, which have been removed uh, um, showed uh, a full recovery to their by baseline uh, um, levels. In summary, this is a kind of interesting technique. Uh, it's not for everybody. As I said, uh, some of the drawbacks are the quality of vision, especially, especially at nighttime. Patients may experience glare, halo, or so, and that was one of the most of the important reasons for them to ask for the three patients I explanted the ELA to uh, uh, be removed. But uh, the technique is interesting. Results are uh, uh, quite satisfactory. Uh, design does not interfere with any other ocular examination or so. So it's certainly something that you may want to explore. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Dr. Carnes, um, what about the centration of cornea? Are you doing this on the center of the pupil or on the visual axis? Usually I stay closer to the visual axis. I would say 50% distance in between the center of the pupil and the uh, corneal apex. Regarding the cases that you explant the cornea inlay, do you have, when you explant the cornea inlay, any fibrovascular membrane as the old inlay? Not at all. No. Not at all. Okay. It, uh, you, you can see the imprint for quite a lot of time, like six months. Uh, you see some kind of hazy reaction, mm -hmm. but nothing more than that. Uh, and this hazy reaction actually impacts the patient's vision in terms of quality, as well as the inlay was doing. So the patients who are explanted report like a uh, I am, uh, you did not really explain it because I still see halos. Uh, this regresses over a six months period. Okay, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Most of the, most of the patients that we extract the inlay from them, it's because it's been decentered or it's away from the visual axis. And that, when we are removing it, the trace of this inlay will kept the visual axis away from the, the centration. So uh, after six months, if that trace remain, what's your opinion? What you will do? I, uh, by now, I have no cases uh, where the trace remained mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. In all cases, uh, it 
frankly disappeared over this period of time. One of the advices that I would give you today yeah. is uh, uh, not to remove any inlays uh, earlier than three months after surgery because most of the patients uh, need that time uh, to get used and to have this kind of uh, neural compensation for the less uh, amount of light that they get in from that eye. So do not remove the inlay before three months. Uh, but if a patient is not happy in between the third and the six months, don't wait longer because uh, this uh, trace, uh, this uh, uh, hazy uh, appearance uh, of the inlay takes longer to remove uh, as uh, later you do the removal. Question to Dr. Ali, please. Thank you. Francesco, without trying to create any controversy, my outcomes are not, not exactly like this, right? Uh, we have been using technologies of inlays, and I have a presentation tomorrow for nine years, so it's a long time. My explantation rate is 20%. And I think that this is happening. And I think that there is a global idea that in real basis is not exactly like in the, in the presentation we see in the meetings. Uh, Dry eye is a problem. We have changes in topography that happens even seven years after the implantation. We have changes in the, in the refraction years after the implantation, and everybody using this technique should know that this is not a, 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 free, a lunch, free lunch. It's not a free lunch. It's something that is like any other thing. You have 2% of, uh, of a posterior capsular uh, break during cataract surgery, and this is happening. You have to expect from 10 to 30% explantation rate with this technique, at least in my hands. And I think that, well, this is exactly what happens in the early post-op. Probably, uh, Francesco, you are using the, the tunnel technique, but those that are using the flap technique should expect a different outcome. And I wonder whether in the long term the tunnel is suffering other type of complications. But indeed, I am using, I am convinced about this technology, but I'm not as happy as the, many of the presentations that I see around the world are, are they really offering. But it's not to create any controversy, but just to offer my own experience. We published two papers on this. One is a confocal microscopy study and really reflects the activation of the kratocytes exists even years after the implantation. But the second one was about what happens once the explantation happens. If you explant the inlay more than six months after the surgery, you leave permanent changes in the topography. Permanent means changes in corner barometry and corner topography that can affect the quality of vision. But if you explant earlier than six months, you have no, no uh, permanent effect on the corner. So there is a, dead, a kind of red line, could be a red Greek line, between six and nine months in which you have either to take the decision to remove or you will leave changes in the corner forever. So just to clarify my okay. experience. Okay. okay, excellent comments. If Our next speaker will be Dr. Antonio Marino, who will speak about solving problems of FECIC IOL with other FECIC IOL video presentation. Dr. Antonio. As you, all, as you all know, fake IKLs are an important tool in refractive surgery, and one of the advantages of fake IKLs are really the reversibility and the possibility of taking them out and the exchange. Uh, I choose to present you two clinical cases where we had complications with fake IKLs, and we solved these complications with other fake IKLs. In, one, in the first case, with the same type of fake IKL, in the second case, with another type of fake IKL. Let us look at, at the cases. So, our first case, like this. Our first case was a female, 45 years of age, with, uh, you see, uh, a very low refraction, but it was a keratoconus suspect, so we chose to implant a fake KOL instead of doing a laser vision correction. You see here, the anterior chamber depth was borderline, and because of that, we chose to implant a posterior chamber IOL and ICL, toric ICL, with the, the value you see there, and uh, we followed the manufacturer's guidelines to the size and the power of the lens. The result at day one was very good with a correct vision of 2020, but we saw that the volt was a little uh, low volt, uh, only 140 micros. And three months after the surgery, the patient came back complaining of low vision. And the vision, as you see, was only 2100 with a mixed cylinder. So, and the volt was the same. So we dilated the pupil, and we saw that ICL was rotated 90 degrees from the original position. 
So, what should we do? Of course, uh, there was, uh, we could rotate the ICL, but we thought the ICL was too short because of that the, um, the vault was small, so we replaced it for a longer ICL of 13.2 millimeters. Can you run the video, please? Can you run the video, please? Okay, thank you. So what we see here in this small video clip is how we exchange the ICL. We took uh, the smaller ICL and put another one, so solving the case. You see here, it's very easy. We, we just uh, put the ICL in the anterior chamber with this manipulator, the same manipulator we use for uh, in the primary search to put the ICL behind the iris, we use a lot of viscoelastic, and then we just go uh, taking the ICL out from uh, the area between the foot plates and the optic, and you see it goes w out very well. This, of course, is what we do when we do cataract surgery after ICL, but here, of course, we must be uh, very careful because the crystalline lens is clear and we do don't want to create a cataract. And then we implant the new ICL without any complications. So this is a, a case of replacing for, for, this is a problem of the ICL if the, the size is not right. Okay, and then we put the new ICL, we constrict the pupil, and it's done. The second case is a case uh, of a female, 28 years of age, with minus 11 refraction. It was a quite small eye with a white to white only 11.5 millimeters and again a borderline anterior chamber. We did an implantation of Acrisoft cache lens of minus 12 and of course uh, of the, the smallest cache possible because of the, the small eye. We did that surgery in 2009. The patient went well, but in two, uh, 2013, we saw what we see here, that there is a, a slight ovalization of the pupil, but most important, there is an upward dislocation of the IOL. You see here, like we have here, synechia that push, pulls the IOL here, and we see the foot plates are free uh, at, at six o'clock and not. Uh, and not in the angle. We do, do the OCT, and we, we, you cannot see here, but the distance, the critical distance, was only 0 0.8 millimeters to the endothelium. Although the endothelial cell count was still in the range of 3,000 uh, cells for square millimeter. Uh, we have there 3,085. So what to do to this patient? Of course, we had to explant this IOL, to prevent further endothelial damage, and we had to replace it. We could replace it for an anterior chamber iris fixated or for an ICL. But as the anterior chamber was very shallow, we preferred to, to exchange for ICL. I show you the video. Can you run the video, please? Okay, thank you. Here we have uh, uh, another uh, problem that we need a constricted pupil or a small pupil to, ex to explant the cachet and then we need to dilate the pupil to implant ICL. You see here that although this, uh, the cachet looked very, very uh, close to the angle in the upper part, there was no synechia and the dislocation of the lens was very easy. We rotate it to the uh, three nine o'clock position, and we explanted the cachet for a 3.2 millimeter incision. So it was easy explantation. We only we explanted three eyes of our series of cachet because of this problem, this eye and two others, exactly the same. And then we implanted ICL. Of course, you had to wait for 10 minutes to dilate the pupil, and then we implanted ICL without any problem, without 
inducing a stigmatism. We have another case that for the sake of time I am not going to present, where we did the opposite. It was a case of PRL that was dislocated with some zonular problems. We explanted the PRL and in that case we exchanged for an artiflex because we were uh, afraid of putting something more in the posterior chamber. So this is to, to show you that we can solve problems of fake EKI wells with the same type or other types of fake EKI wells. So this is the end of the surgery, putting the ICL in place and the patient worked very well. We did the same in another eye of this patient and in another one eye of the patient. So three cases out of 100 cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marino. A question, please, Dr. Marino. Did you explain to any uh, Artiflex or Artisan uh, fake IOL because of the uh, night problems that the patient may have it and replace it by another lens like the ICL? No, for night problems, no. No, really, I have a long experience with Artisan on Artiflex. The, the night problems are more. Uh, uh, possible with artisan because the opt artisan five millimeters because the optic is smaller but if it is well centered I don't have that problem so but regarding I, uh, the, the, the optic is PMMA so the, the incidence of post-operative glare and halos at night is more than the Bussier chamber ICL yes so but you don't have any no I don't have any explanation for that the okay. explanations I have <coughs> changing the fake EGA wells are uh, these I showed you, and also explanations of PRL, but I have a very small experience of luxated lenses that I took out, and in these cases, I don't want to put ICL in, I put Artiflex in. It's another interesting case I have, but Thank not for glare, no. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, our next, next speaker, Dr. Alaa Dinosauri, he will talk Excuse about... Dr. Uh, can he have a... I want uh, to make uh, uh, sure. possible. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, th thank you for the nice presentation. I have two questions for you. One, I have seen in your presentations a trend towards to, to use more the ICL than the Artiflex, and the Artiflex was your favorite for astigmatism for a good reason. The Artiflex cannot rotate. And my second uh, comment is about a disorder in keratoconus patients. It has been, has been published that the, the, um, the distance, sulcus to sulcus distance, is different in keratoconus than in a normal patient. It is remarkable, this observation, because it makes that some of these lenses do rotate in keratoconus, and keratoconus has my epicastigmatism, very frequently treated by fake casual than rotate. And I observed this uh, time ago, and I moved completely to Artiflex. So my question to you is, what do you do in keratoconus? And second, why you are using more the ICL than the Artiflex? Have you observed any long-term problem with the Artiflex? Uh, no, for the first, the first uh, question, I agree with you, and I think this case, this first case I showed was a keratoconus suspect, and probably because of that, the measures were wrong, and we needed a larger uh, ICL, a larger lens. The, the way, the, why I use in this particular case the ICL is because the, the anterior chamber was borderline. 2.8 millimeters. If I had a 3.2, for example, or 3.3 millimeters anterior chamber, I would use Artiflex. I agree with you, the measures are different. How about the trend to ICL? I have used Artiflex for a long time. Now I'm using more the ICL, not because I had problems with the, the Artiflex. I, I have seen mostly with Artisan, six millimeters, some decrease in endothelial cells, 10 to 12 years after the surgery. Uh, I have uh, some, a few cases with lower endothelial cell count and it's because of that I, I'm doing ICL more now. Not with Artiflex, because with Artiflex, we don't have yet, because Artiflex is, too far, too, is 10 years now, is 10 years now, with Artiflex I have not seen that. But with Artisan 6 millimeter optic, I had some case of endothelial, not the compensation, no case of the compensation, but still some endothelial cell loss. And this is the reason. Okay. Um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ale Dinosauri, he will talk about uh, cornea cross-linking and fakic ICL is best in patient with keratoconus and the acceptable visual acuity. Uh, thank you, Sham. Ladies and gentlemen, in the coming 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you uh, our experience at the Maghrabi Hospital in Jeddah with a very uh, exciting uh, 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 technique that we are doing, which is actually combining two uh, safe 
evidence-based, very well-known, long-term uh, efficacy and efficiency uh, procedures to uh, correct the uh, compound myopic astigmatism associated with uh, keratoconus. Uh, This is, that was not my last slide. Can I have my slides again, please? Yeah. Uh, I'm consulting for Star Surgical with manufacturing the ICL. Uh, many of you who are practicing in the uh, Middle East, especially in the Gulf region, know how uh, common is uh, keratoconus in our area as compared to the Western uh, world. Uh, and um, if, I, if I tell our friends and colleagues uh, from, from North America and, and many parts of Europe that we are seeing four to five new patients of keratoconus every day, they would be really surprised. But this is what's happening. Uh, uh, because of many uh, factors, we have uh, uh, too many uh, keratoconus patients in our practice, especially uh, in young people who just come for refractive surgery, they don't even know that they have keratoconus. So over the years I developed this decision tree for my uh, uh, patients with keratoconus and it does not actually rely on the anatomical classification or the pathological classification of keratoconus, but more on the functional uh, 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 more of a functional classification. So I, I spend a little bit more time with the patients trying to understand whether they have an acceptable vision with their spectacle correction. Uh, if they have an acceptable vision, what I do is uh, look at the stability. If the, if the patient has stable keratoconus, then I go directly for a fake intraocular lens if the patient is not, uh, does not want to wear glasses. Uh, if it's progressive uh, condition, then cross-linking is my uh, uh, procedure of choice. Done this over 10 years with excellent outcome. Uh, once we reach stability, then fake IOL as a secondary procedure is uh, a, a choice. If the patient has an unacceptable visual uh, acuity, uh, and intolerant to contact lens, which is the case in most of our patients, then I go directly for DALC. Uh, I just put the intracoronary segments and cross-linking with the PRK just to satisfy my, my, my friends who are doing this, because I do not really believe that this is, procedures are really effective, the uh, 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 intracoronary segments and the cross-linking with surface ablation. Now, if you look at the cross-linking, uh, one year after cross-linking, there is some change of refractive error. It's unpredictable, it's little, but it exists in many cases. The majority of cases has a change between plus and minus one or two diopters of uh, uh, spherical equivalent. Uh, but that's why you cannot offer a refractive procedure before one year from cross-linking. This is the main implication of this uh, point. The, the, the change in cylinder in my, in my hands and this is a series of more than 80 eyes of keratoconus, and, and the change of cylinder after keratoconus is, the mean change is very little, less than a half a diopter of, of astigmatism. In some cases, especially the more advanced cases, you have uh, a, a more change, but in majority of cases, the change is very little. Uh, looking at the vector analysis uh, of the uh, change in astigmatism, there is little change over uh, the first year. So cross-linking is a great procedure, and I think this is one of the best things that happened in ophthalmology in the last 10 years. Uh, it's very effective in stopping the uh, progression of the disease. Complications are very rare, but it does not improve the vision, and it may induce some refractive stains. That's why we wait for one year after cross-linking, and then we offer the patients a, a, a toric ICL, usually toric ICL. In some cases, it's spherical if the cylinder is minimal, but in most of the cases of the toric ICL. Here I'm going to share with you the results of a series of patients uh, uh, with, uh, who had cross-linking, and then one year after cross-linking, we performed, we implanted a toric ICL in their eyes. Patients, they have regular selection criteria for ICL, most important is an anterior chamber depth of three millimeter from the endothelium and stable cornea of course this is a series of 40 eyes of 32 patients uh, uh, with an uh, with the mean age of 24 uh, years old 
Uh, this is one of the very old cross-linking machine we used. I, I, I remember I carried this machine actually in my in my uh, in my suitcase from from Zurich back to Jeddah in 2005. Now there are more fancy machines. Um, uh, this uh, topography shows the change in uh, corneal topography uh, one year after cross-linking, one and a half years actually. There is a little bit of flattening, very minimal flattening in the center of the cone. Uh, in most of my cases, there is very little change. We do see some flattening, but much less than what is reported in the literature. But the, 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 the average Average change in corneal to in in, um, in K readings in our cases is less than 0.75 diopters. Though it, I know it's reported to be two diopters of flattening. Uh, we sometimes see a corneal haze uh, persisting after uh, six months after the surgery in more than 15% of the cases, but it seldom affects the quality uh, of vision. And we're measuring this with the MTF curves, and you can see here there is no change in the uh, quality of vision uh, as measured by the MTF. Uh, one year after cross-linking in this group of patients, we had a visual equity of 2040 or better corrected uh, uh, at one year uh, after cross-linking. Uh, and we implanted a toric ICL under topical anesthesia. Uh, the technique is pretty straightforward li forward like any uh, uh, toric ICL. Uh, I do all my cases under topical anesthesia with a clear corneal uh, three millimeter incision. You can go to 2.7 or even 2.6, but I prefer a three millimeter incision because it makes the procedure much easier and, and uh, straightforward. A viscoelastic in the anterior chamber and then uh, uh, injecting the uh, ICL uh, the, the, the only import, the only uh, uh, step where you need to be really slow is the injection of the ICL. Just inject the ICL in the anterior chamber under viscoelastic, and then you watch the uh, leading haptic till they unfold. Once you have this uh, uh, leading haptic unfolded in the right position, then you can go f and fastly inject, quickly inject the uh, ICL inside the eye. It, it will never go upside down if you uh, uh, make sure that the leading haptics are in the right position. One day after surgery, uh, speedy recovery, patients enjoying very good vision day one. Remember, those patients were seeing 24, all the patients, 2040 or better, with correction before the ICL. Uh, at one year, 90% uh, of the patient could see 20, 30 or better. Uh, they are very happy with the outcome. Predictability is very high. The majority of patients are within plus and minus half the opter of correction. The, the, the challenge here is not the predictability of the calculation of the lens. The challenge here is to reach the right retinoscopy, the, the right end, uh, end point retinoscopy in the keratoconus patient. These are very tricky patients to uh, do refraction on them. Of course, stability, uh, as long as the cornea is stable, you will have a, re a stable refractive error. One of my concerns with the toric ICL was the rotation inside the eye with keratoconus patients, and uh, uh, that's why we are doing the OPD uh, scan for all these patients with a dilated pupil before the surgery, uh, a few days after the surgery if possible, maximum of, of a week, and then we keep following up on these patients to see the rotation of the lens inside the eye. The OPD scan, for those who are not uh, uh, using this instrument, is very nice, is very good machine to show the internal uh, aberration. So it can give you very good idea about the toricity inside the eye. So it can tell you the magnitude and the direction of the uh, astigmatism, of the internal astigmatism, which is, uh, the ICL is part of it now. So it can tell you in this case that the ICL is very well centered, it does not rotate inside the eye, and you're doing this with all our patients, and you're very confident that uh, unless the lens is really small in size, it will not rotate inside the eye. This is an example I'm sharing with you of a patient who had cross-linking. The first topography on your left-hand side is pre-operative, pre-cross-linking. The middle one is one year after cross-linking, and you can see very little change in the topography. And then one and a half years, after uh, uh, um, surgery, which is six months after the uh, toric ICL implantation. So you see the topography is stable all through. Uh, looking at the OPD, which is the total high order uh, aberrations, total aberrations of the eye, high and low order, and you can see that it changed from 
minus 8.5 before the surgery to almost plano after the surgery. And this particular patient had no toric ICL because the cylinder was uh, uh, 1.25, so in these cases we use a, a spheric lens in keratoconus patients. And these patients are enjoying very good outcome. So uh, to conclude, we strongly believe that cross-linking is effective in stabilizing progressive keratoconus, and you all agree on this, we have seen this. Uh, cross-linking may induce some refractive changes. I cannot predict what changes will happen and who, which patient will change. Usually, the more advanced the keratoconus, the more uh, refractive change you have. Uh, toric ICL is highly predictable in correcting the compound myopic astigmatism after cross-linking, and here we, we need to make sure that, that, uh, to, that the patient understands that this procedure is to correct the refractive error and does not correct the corneal pathology. Uh, and the cross-linking followed by toric ICL, in my opinion, uh, uh, is the best option for the eyes who have acceptable or satisfactory uh, uh, corrected visual equity uh, after cross-linking. And I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Ale. Excellent presentation. May I ask you, uh, during uh, calculating the toric ICL or the toric ICL, what key reading you are, uh, how, how do you measure the key reading? Well, I, I get the key reading from my OPD scan, the simulated case. But again, the problem, Hisham, here is the difficulty that I, I found here, I encountered in my early cases, is not the uh, calculation of the IOL. It's straightforward, like any other version I. The problem, but usually the anterior chamber is deeper. If it's deeper, then this will reflect in the calculation. But most, the more difficult part is uh, uh, the retinoscopy to reach the end point uh, refraction of this particular patient. That's why if I have a patient with keratoconus, let's say 25 years old, and he comes with a documented stable refraction for three years with all his, all his old glasses, I do not rush for uh, an ICL unless I give him a new pair of glasses and I make sure that he's happy with this with these glasses for at least two or three months before I go for surgery. You are depending on the subjective Yes, uh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, our next speaker, Dr. Amar Agrawal, he just arrived from the airport. And uh, welcome, Dr. Amar. Uh, he will talk about the predestinant in the Thelic Kratoplast. He's Dr. Amar. How do I pause the video? If I want to. Can you play it? Oh, I have to ask them? Okay. Okay, can you just pause that? Yeah, play the video now. Let me. Sorry, I just came in. Can you pause it now? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just landed, came straight, rushing here. And I have to thank, first of all, Ala, Tamir, the whole Maghrabi group for inviting me for this lovely conference where you have such people like Richard, Francisco, Jorge is here, and so many other great stalwarts. So the, what I'm going to talk to you now is on this technique called pre endothelial keratoplasty. Can you play the tape? Now, if you understand this, you see this patient here, there's a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. Now watch, someone has implanted a PCIOL in the AC. I'm taking off the epithelium. Now we take the donor graft, and I'm going to inject air. Can you pause that now? Just pause it. Could you just pause that? Stop Lovely. the video, please. Now, if you can see, I'm putting a bubble with a 30-gauge needle. Now, you are looking at the endothelium. So when you talk of DMEC, we are taking endothelium and desmase. In DSEC, you're taking endothelium, desmase, and stroma, which is about 100 to 150 microns. DMEC is 15 microns. Here, this bubble is a space I have created between the endothelium desmase and the pre-desmase on one side and the stroma on the other. That makes it a graft of about 25 microns. Now, if you see the advantage in this is, in a DMEC, you cannot strip the desmase 
from the stroma in an infant till the person is about 40 or 50 years. In this, I can do it in a nine-month donor also. Now, once I've got a bubble, if the bubble does not expand, I can expand it further by viscoelastic. Can you play the video now? You see, I've created that bubble. Now, my further expansion, one can be by air, two by MK medium, or three by viscoelastic also. So you can see I'm expanding it further, some cases by viscoelastic, but now I feel better sometimes with MK medium or preferably first choice would be air. Now once you get a size of a graft, you'll get approximately about seven and a half to eight millimeters. You enter inside and you have to cut it. Remember the pre desmase layer is a bit tough, so you cannot just strip it like in a desmase. Now, once you have got the graft ready, I shift to the patient, and now you can see here, I'm making a marker here, because I'm going to do a glued lens implantation with this PDIC. So I'm making two scleral flaps, which are 180 degrees apart. Once they are like that, I will have fluid in the eye. Always have fluid in the eye. You can use an AC maintainer, or a trocar cannula call is yours. Here I fix an AC maintainer, take a 20 gauge needle, enter inside and through that you can do a vitrectomy. Now watch carefully, the surgeon had implanted a PCIOL in the AC. Now I'm not going to explant the IOL. The same IOL I'm going to externalize by making a PCIOL in the AC to a PCIOL in the PC. Remember, this is a one-piece, non-foldable IOL. Very tricky, because if you manipulate slightly, it will break. If it was a three-piece, it's very easy. Now you notice here, once I've externalized it, I'm using two hands with two forceps, glued IOL forceps, and this is the handshake technique. You got to catch the tip of the haptic. Only if you catch the tip of the haptic, you will externalize it. Otherwise, what will happen is the haptic will break. So first haptic out. Now I'm externalizing my second haptic. And you can see there just now, second haptic is out. Now once both haptics are out, do some vitrectomy around the sclerotomy. Once I have done that, create this lovely Gebor Shariat's tunnel. This lovely intrascleral pocket started by this great man from Germany, Gebor Shariat, and I'm tucking it inside. Remember, a three-piece IOL, you can flex and tuck. A single piece, non-foldable IOL, you have to withdraw and tuck, because it will just break otherwise. Once both haptics are in place, pause. Watch, I put the air, it didn't stay inside. So this is a simple trick you'll realize that why is it not staying inside? Can you play the video, please? The reason it's not staying inside is I need to do a pupiloplasty. If I don't do my pupiloplasty and make my whole area smaller, the air will go into the vitreous cavity and post-operatively my graft will detach. So our next step, go ahead and do a pupiloplasty, which you can see I'm going to do. And you can do anything started by this lovely great man from Minneapolis, uh, McCannell. And I'm making the pupil small. So now I have a glued eye wheel, which works like a trampoline because it's very firmly fixed. And my pupiloplasty has been done. Now you see after the pupiloplasty, I will put in the air and you will see the air is going to remain nicely in place. So, once my pupiloplasty has been done, the next step for me is to check, look, the air is staying nicely. So now I know I'm on track. Now I go ahead, remove my endothelium. This you all know very well. But when I do this, I always have an air pump working which pumps air inside. The same one which I use in my FACO surgery, which now in Centurion and also Stellaris, they have this installed for FACO machines. So the same air I'm using inside here, once I removed, I take my graft, I just load it on a simple injector, your IOL injector. This was a trick taught to me by Francis Price. And I want to tell you, PDEC, uh, we did it in collaboration with Harminder Dua from UK. And once I have injected the graft inside, I don't know which side is right. I don't know which side is wrong. Off the light, 
Now watch, I'm using an endo illuminator and immediately you can see the curve like this. This trick was taught to me by my doctor Susan Jacob. It's called endo illuminator assisted PDEC. Same thing you can do in DMEC, but look at the difference the endo illuminator is making. Once this happens, now I know I'm bang on track. I know my graph is correct side up. Now we go ahead, unroll the graph with fluid and air. Once I have unrolled the graph, I will go under the graph, inject the air and tamponade it. So once you have done this, the game is on, then we have to finally use the glue to seal everything down. Now you can see here, I'm just tamponading the whole graph there, seeing everything is fixed. Once my graft is attached, as you can see there, small fold is there. I will unroll that small fold also. And at the same time, air is continuously being infused into the anterior chamber. Once I have got my graft unrolled and fixed in place, I know I'm on track. End only, I will shift to the fibrin glue application. Because once my graft is fixed, I will then use the glue to seal my flaps of my IUL down and the same glue I can use to seal my clear corneal incision. Now the question comes after all this, how did this patient behave? Because that is the borderline question which we all have to ask ourselves. And look at the patient now, post-op one week, you can see how it is. And now you can see the post-op seven months of this patient. And this is how the patient looks immediately, seven months post-op. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent presentation, Dr. Ambar. Thank you very much. Our last uh, speaker will be Dr. Fernandez from Spain. He will talk about gratography and the tear lab technique. Dr. Fernandez. Okay, thank you very much for the scientific committee for the invitation. Well, what could be our worst outcome in refractive surgery and even in press BOP correction? We think that uh, jadrogenia. We, can, we need to avoid any cause of it, and we think that dry eye could be one of the most important causes for creating jadrogenia. We are in front of a patient. We, can, we could have uh, asymptomatic dry eye, and with the surgery, with the refractive surgery and press BP correction, we can convert it, him to a symptomatic uh, dry eye. So that I think that we are focusing on that aspect in our surgery, in the preoperatory diagnosis. We think that uh, we have very two important situations in dry eye. One is the teraphine instability, and the second, the hyperosmolarity that is considered the core mechanism in the develop of the dry eye. So we are going to need a very sensitive diagnosis equipment in order to create a dry eye screener. And on the other hand, we are going to need a very high specificity uh, equipment to confirm the diagnosis. In, first of all, we have uh, working with the Keratograph 5M with the uh, Oculus equipment that we, we are going to have different tools to manage uh, the, pre the diagnosis uh, of the dry eye. I think that we have two tools very important. is the uh, measurement of the tear meniscus and the uh, time of breakup time, not invasive. And after that, we are going to have three other tools with uh, the study of the lipid layers the dynamic of it, uh, of the particular flow, and also the MABO scan. So with uh, a scan, we, we can measure the tilmeniscus high measure, uh, probably less than 0 0.1 millimeter, we are going to have a pathological uh, meniscus, and overall, we are going to have a normal. We can measure with a caliper in the software, and we need to add also the backup time with a um, not invasive method, and we can do with uh, LED uh, uh, illumination. After that, we can classify our dry eye. It's, I think it's very important in order to achieve the better treatment for our patients. 
And well, we can see that in the time of breakup time, we can see the first breakup time and also the mean. And we could uh, very easily uh, diagnose uh, the, treat, uh, the patient of the dry eye, even for our technician. It's not uh, a explorer. It's not explorer dependent. We can see also the dynamic of the particle of the flow in the in the tears, and also we can study uh, the mabel glands. We can see the atrophia, the distortion, and the empties of the glandules. And once we have a very sensible uh, suspect of uh, dry eye, we need to confirm the diagnosis and we think that uh, studying the osmolarity of the tears, we are going to confirm that. Because of the tear osmolarity, we, we know that it's increased in dry eye patients, as it's been published in a lot of papers. And we know also that the molarity has the highest positive predictive value. Is that uh, the rate of the DC patient in order to the positive of the uh, equipment and the technician, the procedure. So we have a breakup uh, in date in the 308 milliosmol. Uh, per light, and we know that we can follow up the patient, not only um, doing the diagnosis, but also the follow-up of the treatment, as we have seen in, in other paper. So in conclusion, we know that the keratograph and the tear lab system can help us in the dry eye diagnosis. The keratograph is a non-invasive instrument to measure ocular parameter related with corner curvature and also the tear state. And the tear, tear lab is used to measure tears of molarity that can co prevent us the test with the highest predictive positive value in the AI diagnosis. So tear of molarity is an objective method to evaluate treatment effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we uh, finish our uh, great um, symposium and uh, we thank all the speakers and all the audience for attending this interesting one and see you in the next session. Thank you very much. Coming up, Coming up next, next in, in Hall B. B.